What's up, Military Billionaires? I'm your host, David Bray, and uh, today we have my friend Ziana on the show, and we are going to be talking about, well, medium-term rentals or mid-term rentals or whatever the buzzword is, and her new book, 30 Days Day, as well as the fact that she's sitting here in a wedding dress because apparently she's married today and for some reason (laughs) is podcasting with me, which is... I, I'm so the a work little, never stops. Yeah, you I'm should still, know this. I don't know if I'm baffled or uh, <laughs> flattered or I don't know, but uh, no, she. Uh, this is this is going to be fun. So I appreciate you yeah. joining me. And uh, why don't you give the audience a little bit of your uh, uh, introduction, a little bit of your background? Yeah. So I have been a short and medium term host for now ten years. I got started in Airbnb back in 2012 accidentally. (laughs) And then it took over my whole life. So now I have been doing it for, yeah, a decade. And I own properties in four states. So I am in Missouri, Washington, Florida, and Colorado, where I live. And yeah, we just came out with this book, 30 Day Stay with Bigger Pockets. So happy to dig into all and any of it. And you're one of my favorite people. So that's why I'm here on my wedding. Cutie. I appreciate that. (laughs) Where, where in Missouri? Um, St. Louis. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, cool. Yeah. I'm in the Southwest corner, but so not, not nearly as close, but, um, man, 2012. So you were, I mean, that's pretty much, I can't remember exactly what your Airbnb started at. I mean, you must've been 2008. Yeah. Pretty, pretty close to beginning phases of Airbnb. Uh, Absolutely. It was like nobody knew what I was talking about, so I just didn't talk about it. I was like, yeah. <laughs> I'm curious, like if you go back to, you know, when you first started dabbling uh, and, and then now when it's obviously much more saturated, do you think yeah. that it has become easier as a host over time or or with... I mean, it's it's probably like a little bit of a yin and yang, but there's a whole lot more guests, obviously, but there's also a whole lot more hosts and and there's more help from Airbnb, but there's also more, you know, expectations, I would imagine, from guests Tons, now. Yeah. So I'm curious, like, if you think that back to two, 2013 when it was like, oh, yeah, some random person has a house that I can crash in and there weren't really expectations and probably not as much weight on reviews, you know, how things have changed over the last decade. Yeah, there are a few things that are easier. So when I got started, there were no automations. It was just a really basic site. And so now there's probably hundreds to thousands of different things that you can plug into that make your life really easy. Um, So that is definitely great. But I got to live through some really exciting times of like, between 2015 and 2017, it was like every single year you could charge more. It was just like, because there was just more demand and more people um, traveling on Airbnb, it was just kind of amazing. And it was before all the regulations came in. So I had to pivot with those times as well. Um, But yeah, it's just been really sweet to grow up with Airbnb. I found it when I was a college student. So even just the way I run a business and the way that I designed was so different. It was like minimalist college chic. (laughs) And now it's super professional with designers and stuff. So yeah, it's, uh, it's grown with me. Minimalist design college chic is, is, is that slang for, I can't afford that furniture, (laughs) but this will do. Yeah. Like ramen ramen noodles equals diet. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I dumpster dove for a lot of my stuff. Awesome. I mean, good, frugal. good old times. You call it frugal. Super. <laughs> uh, yeah. Garage sales, all the things. So. I love it. Uh, yeah. yeah. So my my office, I, I think I've told you about this place, but so my my office is the it's a two one that was built into the basement of a house. Uh, and so it's a walkout. It's not it's not a duplex. They never got it zoned. And honestly, I'll probably never try because I can't imagine anything they did is up to code. Like for example, the air duct that runs through the basement here has no actual vents into the basement. Like the HVAC doesn't go into the basement. It just is, it's in the basement, but it only goes into yeah. the, anyway. Um, but it's got a full two, one down here, right? Kitchen, bath, yeah. uh, two beds, living room, laundry room, walkout. And so I use it as my office. 
Uh, and then the upstairs is a four bed, two and a half bath with a massive den and the porch. It's 3,200 square feet. And, you know, the Airbnb covers, brings in 2,800 to 3,000. And my all in cost for the entire house is about 26 to 2,800, including internet utilities and everything else. So it's a break even nice. for me with the office. So it's great. Uh, mm -hmm. But when I moved here, basically what I did was I took all the furniture that I'd had when I was living in military housing because I moved back here and I was like, well, crap, I don't, I can't put all this in my house that we already had furnished in Missouri. So it's just like, I could, I could probably do a lot better and actually buy all new furniture <laughs> and design the house, but it's, yeah. it's not necessarily hodgepodge because it was in a house. So it was somewhat coherent, but it's like. I already have furniture for a house. I, we're just going to kind of stick it in here and buy a few odds and ends to put it together. And, you know, it works, but it's, yeah. uh, I mean, if I'd gone to furnish the whole thing, it would have been another like 20 grand. <laughs> so Yes. But let me house. tell you something. So this is pretty fun. Um, a friend of mine, Natalie Palmer, who is like an Airbnb host kind of influencer and podcaster, she posted, and this was a perfect timing because it was in the middle of me spending far too much money remodeling one of my places. And I was just like, oh, I'm bleeding money. And then I saw her post that night that was showing that she manages nine places in the exact same building. And the only difference, because they have the same location, the same manager, the same cleaner, the same handyman, was the furnishings. And those places the lowest grossing one made 40K a year and the highest was closer to 90. And so it's really that much different just to have great furniture. And so it is worth that 20 grand investment, I think, if you were going to spruce it up. And you probably could even keep a couple of the things so yeah. you wouldn't need to spend that much. But I would do it if you have the stomach for it. Yeah, <laughs> I might have to might have to go find myself a designer and, and rock out here. Oh, I the know house itself You is let nice. me know. <laughs> <laughs> Next time you're out in St. Louis, I'll just tell you to stop off on the way. Yeah. I mean, people design from afar, which is really cool, but um, there's kind of different tiers. You can get just a list where they're like, here, order all this stuff. Or they can like fully fly out and, you know, there's everything in between. So there you go. Yeah. Yeah, it's a super cool house. It's got, you know, vaulted ceilings with like beams and porch, like covered porch, and it overlooks uh it's in town, so it's got all the nice mm -hmm. amenities, but it overlooks a floodplain and the so it overlooks a flood like a little valley, and the two houses on either side are both like you know, in Missouri when I say like seven hundred to one point two million. That uh, is that, fancy. We're talking like look. a castle. Yeah, like one one, <laughs> yeah. one of them one of them is literally like I showed a friend of mine on a map the other day and he knew the owner's name immediately because he was like, Oh, that's that house. Like it, it's just you know, you see it on a map. A landmark. And you're like, oh, that's that guy. <laughs> so yeah. you know, so like the the house overlooks this little floodplain valley that is in town, and it's like because of that, there's deer and turkey and nobody can ever build there, but it's like in the Aww. middle of it's it's kind of a cool little location so you're right it'd probably be worth spending the money to design oh i'm always help. right oh, <laughs> just in case you were wondering fair enough <laughs> all right so at what point did you start dabbling in the midterm stuff and why yeah so the intentional dabble because of course during that whole term of doing short-term rentals i had gotten a few medium-term stays just anybody over 30 days is kind of fair game for that but I intentionally switched over during COVID because there was this literally one day to the next. I had gotten off of a podcast. It was like March 10th, 2020. And a friend was like, what do you think of all this COVID stuff? Do you think it's going to affect short-term rentals? And I'm like, nah, I haven't seen anything happen. And like the next freaking day, every <laughs> reservation canceled. And I was like, all right, well, <laughs> maybe. Yeah. yeah, maybe. Um, and I had this kind of come to Jesus moment where I was like, man, maybe this business that I have built over eight years and like literally let everything else go to do this one thing, maybe that's over. Yeah. Um, but I quickly picked myself up with my investor cap on and was like, well, these places are not going to sit vacant. So I'm going to figure some yeah. something out. And luckily at the same time, I started to see requests come in for longer stays of people that needed to quarantine before they reintroduced to their families, um, needing a bigger space to school from home and work from home. 
and emergency kind of like uh, military nurses, a lot of stuff like that. And so I started to go, well, maybe I don't have to do long-term rental and I can keep them furnished and I can try this midterm, medium-term space. And yeah, it's it's grown a lot and it's a very exciting space because I think there's a lot of room to grow even from here. Yeah. yeah. I didn't dabble per se, but I accidentally, I guess, kind of did the same thing. Uh, right. So I, I was in San Diego and I was, I guess you'd call it Airbnb arbitraging. I was, mm-hmm. I was trying to house hack there. And at the time I couldn't, uh, the VA loan still had a cap, so I couldn't house hack. I couldn't buy a, a duplex, triplex, fourplex because of the limit. Of course, that got yeah. lifted, lifted like five months after I moved back to California. So <laughs> if I'd just been patient and known that was going to happen, then I would have been great. But uh, If only you, know, you had a crystal ball. I know, right? So <laughs> here I am helping all these other guys buy fourplexes for millions of dollars in San Diego, and I didn't. I missed the ball, boat. But um, I did get a brand new. I was like, I got to pick if I wanted real grass or turf type of brand new house uh, in a development where I locked in a two-year lease for 3000 a month and said, hey, uh, I will rent it on the spot, sight unseen today for the full two years if you're cool with me renting out bedrooms when my family's out of town. And uh, they were like, oh yeah, that's fine. And I just didn't mention that my family was going to move back to Missouri so they would be out of town 95% of the time. Um <laughs> And so it was a four bed and I used one as my room, one as the office, and then Airbnb, two of the bedrooms. And uh, then I had one who moved in as a roommate, best friend. I don't know if you've actually, you've probably met, you might've met John at maybe at Bigger Pockets conference last year, but uh, mm. anyway, good friend of mine. And then uh, I had a couple staying with me for like 15 days, right when COVID hit and they, they're like you're stuck with us now we're gonna they just literally stay they had moved out there to figure out that, like if they were going to stay out there for a while or not and they were trying to look for a place and they basically said hey uh would you be cool if we just stayed until we figure stuff out and they were they were a really nice couple um and they offered to you know i know this is not what you're supposed to do but they were like we'll just pay you cash if you're cool with it and i was like as long as you guys pay up front i'm cool with yeah. that and they month over month cash up front for it was like four and a half five months um and it was great you know basically broke even on the rental for like the first six months of covid and then when they moved out i went back to renting the room out great so you just got to like ride out the shitty part (laughs) the uh like everybody didn't know what was happening part you're like well they're just gonna stay it's great yeah and the the guy was like a former like competitive triathlete and i was training for a half iron man and so he would like take me out cycling and we would like just Mm. go ride bikes and stuff and then come back and he would yeah it was it was pretty funny he was a masseuse too so he'd be like you know oh yeah you need you know it was like literally the best roommates ever yeah they were they were a nice couple (laughs) well it's funny because i think people get stuck on the idea of like ooh, strangers coming into my house that sounds really weird But what I found when I had like the Airbnb roommate renting out a room is that I would get so excited because these people would be coming in from different adventures and I get to live vicariously through them. And they'd either be in the room or be gone all the time, or we would just totally hit it off. And it would be like, I don't have to do this, but let me take you on my favorite hike and let me take you out to my favorite place to eat and let's do everything together until you leave. So it would just kind of be a great mix. So I, I always loved that. Yep. I I only had one, one really bad experience and it was, if, if anybody's seen my TikTok with the voicemail, you, you know, but, um, it was bad. It was long story short. She, the, the voicemail was after I left a review that was two stars that basically the review review said, and this summarizes everything, but the review said she ate my roommate's meal prep drank my scotch smoked at the house and that was pretty much it like she was like eating food out of the fridge and like she drank i had a bottle of uh like mccallan 18 year like you know like a 200 dollar mm. bottle of scotch that she drank and then replaced with a three dollar and 99 cent bottle of red wine oh, gosh like, thanks lady and then uh <laughs> so i left the review and then she like threatened to sue me and like came back to the house and i was like oh oh that was the only one 
It was the only there you one. Go. You know, I know. I think people always want to hear a horror story. And I'm like, man, even 10 years in, it's really hard for me to think of one. It's yeah. just and, I've had so many great experiences. And she was nice. Like while she was staying, yeah. like we had decent conversations. It was just the fact that I couldn't get past like the just no boundaries. I was like, come on. Like I, I offered you beer. I did not offer you really expensive alcohol that was hidden out of sight elsewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But people but people. okay so you got into it when when like is that would you say that that is your main strategy now or is that just a proponent like what when did you decide that was kind of the going to be the move yeah so i mean it continues to evolve so what i like to tell people is there's three ways to do this space and the very like low-hanging fruit way that we talk about in our book is just like airbnb and furnish finder um, and if people don't use Furnish Finder, it's getting more popular, but it was primarily for the medical professionals. And so lots of traveling nurses. But what I've learned over time is that Furnish Finder is where someone goes to get a deal. So if they are higher up like a doctor, they're going to have the placement agency or the recruiter go get them housing. But the nurse says, oh, give me the stipend. Let me see if I can get something cheaper. And so they go to Furnish Finder and Facebook groups and they look for a deal there. So on Furnish Finder, where everybody's getting their comps, it's actually priced low. And so that second tier is corporate housing, which people may have heard about, um, but that can be anything from government contracts, film contracts, medical insurance. insurance, and that pays even more than short-term rentals. So that's the space that I'm just getting into now, and hopefully we'll write another book on because it's fascinating. Um, yeah, those insurance and then beyond that, you could awesome. really get into networking directly with agencies and uh, recruiters. But that's that's a lot of work. It's a lot of cold calling. Yeah. yeah. When you when you say recruiters, are you talking about like uh, somebody like like for uh, big companies in town, and they try to like as a part of their uh, package for employment. It's like, Hey, look at this awesome place that we will put you up in or yes, that's because cool. the recruiter ends up making a portion of that person's salary. So it's like a bonus for them. And so they're really trying to get these people to say yes. And one of the ways that they can lure them in is with a really great place. And so if they know you in town and know that you have, you know, these really awesome short term rentals that now you're converting to corporate housing, that's going to make you their best friend, right? Because you're yeah, helping them cool. get this great client. Yeah. Yeah. And I've, I've yeah. always known the the insurance ones are are good if you can land it. They're not necessarily the longest term per se, but- uh, I mean, they know, can be. Insurance claims. We had a request well. the other day for insurance and it was six months. Oh, wow. uh, we didn't end up landing it, which I'm still very sour about, but <laughs> they'll keep coming. I feel certain of that. But yeah- um, that's a whole new level that we're really trying to get into. Yeah. And I wonder how, like, I mean, that's probably, it's probably hit or miss depending on your market. Like, I mean, it's, it, I'm sure, I mean, obviously it happens everywhere, right. Depending on situations, but especially somewhere that's prone to natural disasters, I'm sure that's even more popular, right? Like you imagine. That's interesting. You know, I didn't like think Florida. about that where you're like, like hmm, where are we going to have more disasters? I mean, Let's if you go there. You know, as messed up as that sounds, <laughs> if you think about it, right? Like the panhandle yeah. when a hurricane comes through, how many of those people are going to be out of a house for months, you know, years? You need to just be right on the edge of that so you don't get caught in the hurricane either, you know? Yeah, just you know, like not, on a hill. Yeah. There you go. Put your house on taller stilts than everyone else, but um, yeah big wall around it. I don't know. Um, right next to where the volcano is in Hawaii, but just out of the lava flow strategically. There you go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I mean, You're you going to be the most successful. It's all about <laughs> thinking creative and you're taking it a step further. What? Why is it. David buying houses right next to massive insurance risks? Don't worry about <laughs> it. Yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> that's, it's like just as bad as having like the sleazy billboards that are like, yeah. Anyway. Don't worry. <laughs> Call me. I'll fight your case. You only pay if I win. 
Ugh, the worst. <laughs> oh man, that's cool. Yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned that because a lot of people, yeah, they they go after you know like the travel nurse gigs and stuff, but some of those those corporate housing and and some of the other stuff I hadn't even thought about the recruiting side but I mean the corporate housing stuff is definitely lucrative that's what we're trying to do with our hotel is get into uh corporate housing as well or like corporate stays as well as uh we're really trying to go after and target trucking agencies so like we're mm. kind of on a major thoroughfare for semis and and just logistic stuff in general and so we realized hey why are we not talking directly to local like logistics and transportation companies that are like the the dispatch for these guys like you know, yeah the, hey we will give you a Don't discount they normally if you sleep tell in your... their truck though i just it feel de- like most it, truckers do that it depends on you know i mean a lot of times yes but you know they depending on how long they've been on the road a lot of them do want a shower right yeah or a, an actual bid um, and it also depends on, you know, where they're, where they're going, what they're, what they're pulling. I don't know. Yeah. So this is really interesting, but I heard about this type of rental strategy the other day at a party at a holiday party. And I was like, damn, that never crossed my mind, but you know how they have houses for like, uh, bunk houses for, um, flight attendants and pilots and stuff like that, where it's kind of like short term stays. Yeah. Well, there's a whole underground of like dungeons and places that are safe for sex workers. And I would not have thought of that at all. And they're renting on sites that are different than Airbnb. They have special sites for sex workers. And so even in towns where short-term rentals are illegal, you could still have them by the week because people actually go on tour as sex workers, especially some of the ones that have a bigger following. And so I was just riveted at this party, listening to this girl. I was like, damn. That's amazing. I would not have thought of that at all. So I, yeah, yeah. There is a. I I stumbled across a TikTok at one point where a couple is, and and I they I actually thought and maybe maybe not, but I actually thought that theirs was on Airbnb, but they have it. It's like I forget what the TikTok is, but something something Red Room, you know, typical name. Um, yeah. But it's basically that, right? It was absolutely one hundred percent a short term stay, marketed as. You know, and I was like, man, that yeah, is kind of dungeon or something. Very, very unique. And obviously the cleaning protocols gotta be intense, but yeah, I would imagine very lucrative endeavor because you know, I mean, if you think about it, right, what what kind of industry are people probably more willing to whip their wallet out for than something they're passionate about? I don't know. So. Absolutely. And I think people when they think sex workers, they think somebody's standing out on a corner. But yeah. there are really high end like dominatrix and experienced providers and stuff where they're like thousands an hour. And so for them to rent a nice space and actually, you know, follow through and be there for a while and all this stuff. Yeah. Just make sure everything's really easy to wipe off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no yeah. fabrics. Everything's pleather, man. <laughs> that's, a, that's a business that might not have done so hot in the middle of COVID, but you yeah. never know. Um, yeah adapt with the times in that you know as as funny as that is to i I shouldn't say funny right i wouldn't make fun of anybody for anything like that but as interesting as it is to talk about ideas even like that it just goes to sit what i'm always talking about for anyone who's heard me say it on the podcast is you can make money doing anything if you're passionate enough about it so if that is the route you want to go if you if you're creative enough and passionate enough about it, you can you can find a way. Um, even yeah. if even if the way is building out a cage in your basement and marketing it to dominatrixes to whatever. Totally. Yeah, I was listening. I was listening to these two girls talk because I'm introverted, but I like to just sit next to someone who's extroverted and just like get all the juice. Um, and the one girl was saying like, she does very much like what most of our friends do where she has a course and she sells how to like safely be, um, like work with a sugar daddy or be like a sex worker. I mean, it was just so fascinating. I was like, yeah, you really can take any topic just so happens. We both work in real estate or financial independence and we teach about that, but like you can take the same model and make money teaching on anything. So yeah, I was, a- I was enthralled. There's a girl that I was introduced to in 2019. My buddy Phil uh, introduced me. We were at a 
a food truck. I was at the 10X Growth Conference and he was in a mastermind group with her uh, or in a big mastermind group and she just happened to be a part and they had all met at this food truck and I tagged along with them. And he introduced me just mainly just because she had an Instagram following and I had an Instagram following. So he was like, oh, you guys should talk. And her her Instagram tag is, I think it's rack, racks, like racks to riches. And I, I still every now and then see her pop up on my feed because I just never unfollowed her. But it was kind of fascinating to me. And I, I, I still every now and then I laugh about it and I still see what she's doing. But uh, her entire Instagram following is that she is an exotic dancer and she teaches exotic dancers how to make more money. And so it's sales and it is actually really yeah. fascinating. I've definitely like seen some of her stuff where she'll do like sales tips. And it's like, when the guy says this, here's how you, and it's like, put your hand on his shoulder this way. And instead of using this phrase, use this. And I'm like, and from a guy to, as like a guy to like read that, I'm like, yeah, that would totally work. Like, that's a, that's You're like a it's way, working on me I'm, right I'm like, now. I'm like, that's a way better way to word that, you know, it's very interesting. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's cool to, you know, see it and be like, man, here's a girl who found a way I guarantee she makes more money doing that than she ever did dancing. Right. And, yeah. um, but it's, it's just interesting. Anyway, we got, just went we got off topic, but it was yeah. very so interesting. Back to houses. I feel like this um, is great. Yeah. <laughs> do you, do you do any arbitrage or do you own all of yours? I own everything now. Yeah. I started that way though, you know, yeah. and I, I think that's a great way for people if they need to get going without any money. Right. It's like, you can rent out a spare room in your house. A lot of people don't know this, but on Airbnb, you don't have to rent, um, like a contained space. It can be a couch in the living room. You can do a tent in the backyard. People rent RVs that are just parked in their driveway. So there's just lots of options. And so don't feel like you need to break the bank to get started. And it also allows you to try it before you fully invest and go in thinking, oh, shit, I actually don't like this at all. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you could just turn it right off. So I think it's great. But what I tell people is I think the money in real estate is made with appreciation and building equity. And so if you are only arbitraging, you're basically like a wholesaler or flipper, like you have a job. And you're not getting that passive income. Even if it's an easy job, you still have a job. So I always try to go get that active income, invest it into something that makes you passive income. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I like it. Yeah, Ar arbitrage is, like you said, it's it's a good way to get your foot in the door, but I, I don't necessarily love it all the way. There's a lot of, I think, downsides potentially to it compared yeah. to uh, actually owning the asset and being able to control the asset. Um, yeah. But there's- I felt there's... really insecure when I was arbitraging. I always was like, oh man, is this going to be the phone call? It's going to mean that I have to move or that I'm going to do something or I'm going to get kicked out or, you know, you just don't have control, like you're yeah. saying, of that asset. And so, yeah, I just wanted to have- I have more control. You never have all the control, right? <laughs> HOA, city, there's always somebody looming, but um, yeah, just more. Yeah, I feel you there. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, and then as a host, you got to make sure that you can actually deal with guests. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And that's probably the, the thing that is sometimes the hardest for me as a host is telling myself to, you know, reminding myself that the host the guest is always right like you know being like oh yeah of course the fridge is dirty you're absolutely correct oh yeah the the toilet is is definitely clogged it, it is totally not because your kid flushed a tonka truck down the freaking mm. pipe and not your fault at all uh, of course yeah nope definitely my fault i will totally leave you a five-star review please do the same like yeah you know, well i think that's a really good sometimes. point that short-term rentals is hospitality and midterm i love that it's kind of this middle ground people do not expect as much from you and generally the people that i'm serving i think they have been in just not as nice units for so long like the units that were available to nurses were a lot of like granny kind of basements that so they're so excited to have more inventory out now that's competitive, that's really nice, like short-term rentals. 
And so I think that's just, they're so much more pleased already. And they have a little bit of pride of rentership is what we call it, which is kind of a weird thing. Um, but if they're staying there a longer time, they, they want to take care of it and make it a nicer space. And so I feel like you're in a partnership more than at service. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good point. That makes sense. So what do you, what do you, uh, what would you consider to be like some of the most important things to keep in mind as a host? What would you say uh, when yeah. you're getting started? Like, what are what are some good things to keep in mind? Um, I mean, if I'm thinking about what I'm going to supply in the house, things that are really important are blackout shades because a lot of the nurses, at least, work night shifts, mm -hmm. um, and so you just want to make sure that they can sleep during the day. Sometimes people put noise machines, but I don't know that you need that. Um, and then I always have desks. So even if they're really small writer's desk, I think those are great to have because a lot of people are traveling for work or digital nomads. Um, so having to work from the dining table is not as comfortable as if you've got like a desk with a decent chair. So yeah, a couple little things, but we're not going super overboard. I think for us, we just really want to make sure that the house is designed well and comfortable so that it looks good in pictures. Because people are really excited to stay in a, a cute place. So design, again, is really important. Yeah, makes sense. Are you, uh, with travel nurses, are you doing, uh, like, by the room? Are you doing multiple nurses in the same place? or the whole I don't. Place? No? Yeah, so I try to keep things as easy as possible. I do think that's a strategy that works. A lot of people are doing that. Um, but for me, it seems like too management intensive where it's like people moving in and out on different days then having to navigate personalities and cleaning. And I just don't want to do it. No, but I if you agree. live in the property, I think that that's a, a better way to leverage what you can make than just having regular roommates. You can have nurse roommates that are there like half the time yeah. and pay more, pay twice as much. Yeah. <laughs> so win, win. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Well, and I've, and I've heard from uh, my friend, Stacy, who's a nurse and has done travel nurse. Uh, she was saying I know that Stacy. Oh yeah. <laughs> and uh, she was, she was saying that one of the things, you know, when she was doing some rent by room to travel nurses, she was saying uh, that something to keep in mind is if you do that, like which part of the hospital do they work in? Cause she was like, you know, you get different personalities a lot of times mm -hmm. for different jobs in the hospital. And she's like, if you put, you know, two ER nurses in a house with a like, you know, a, lab I don't know. tech, or yeah, something. like a lab tech or something. She's like, they're probably not going to get along because you've got like an ICU I nurse and, uh, <laughs> you know, blood pressure or whatever is, is like, there's a really good chance that they have completely different personalities. <laughs> and I was like, eh, it kind of makes sense. Like, I guess, I mean, I don't know. I, I, it's hard for me. Like I get it, but I don't. Cause like in the military, it'd be like the same thing as putting like an infantry guy together with like an admin guy. But at the same time, like they would still get along in the military, even though they're totally yeah. different, you know? So you just never know. Yeah. But I think like people shoot themselves in the foot a little bit because they go, Oh, I have a four bedroom house. So that's definitely not going to work for nurses, but they're wrong. Usually um, you can get a bigger family. So like a doctor traveling with his family, insurance clients, but also you'll see nurses traveling in packs. So even though they're going to have their own room, you may get three or four traveling together where they go on assignment together and then they all split off and travel and then they come back together and do different assignments. So you do see that. That's cool. Yeah. Or, or they, yeah. With, like you said, with your family, like my buddy, uh, JJ, yeah. him and his wife and their two kids are traveling around. So love it. Yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah, I am enjoying. So, what's next? What's the what's the goals? You've written a book, you've gotten married, and you own wow. Airbnbs in four states over the last decade. And what's the what are the goals now? Well, I think what I'm learning now is that in this space, especially if I'm really tackling corporate housing, I'm going to do better if I go deep in one market instead of being as spread out as I have been. Um, and when I got started, I got to this place where I was managing for other people. So I learned all the automations and I learned how to manage from afar. And so I kind of just bought wherever I found a cool deal and didn't really worry about them being close by. 
now I think I'm wanting to really concentrate so that when somebody calls me up and I've built these relationships locally, I can say, oh yeah, I have eight places. So I can always say yes. I can always fill your need. Um, mm. So that feels important. And then the second thing, the fun thing is that I just want to do stuff for fun. I mean, I've been financially independent now since I was 28. So that's a lot of years ago. Um, <laughs> eight years. And I think for me, collecting money for money's sake is not as interesting, but um, writing a book was something I never thought I would do. And so my next endeavor is I want to have a TV show. So Ooh. anybody out there, That's let me exciting. know, call me up. Um, but yeah, so I'm trying to manifest that. I just think it'd be fun. Glam squad. I just want all of that. Glam squad. <laughs> there you go. That'd be fun. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. It'd be cool. Yeah. I'm trying to land a, I decided this week that I'm going to try to land a TV episode. I don't care about a show, but okay. I've got a. Uh, now I want to be that main bitch, you know? I've, I have a story <laughs> that needs to be told and I don't know where to tell it yet. But it needs it needs coverage somewhere, and mm. I think I was thinking like it'd be a great podcast episode or YouTube video somewhere, but I'm almost thinking that it needs to end up on like TV somewhere. So the the story of my lawsuit over the last four years that is finally closed. We settled a month ago. Uh, Congratulations! I, got all my money. I, mean, I don't even want, know what the lawsuit's everything. about, but fucking <laughs> lawyers and lawsuits is the most stressful shit ever. Yeah, well, we, I mean, it, you know, at the end of the day, uh, after four years, I won, me and my partner won everything. I mean, wow. everything like across the board, everything in our favor, a uh, complete judgment, complete settlement. Um, but the story itself is just absolutely bonkers. Like it's one of those things where thank God I still have screenshots of texts and emails because nobody would believe anything that I say happened in this endeavor. Cause it's like, it's just, it's ridiculous. And so it's like, man, it's probably worth it. Like, it's a story that's like, there, there's gotta be a way to tell this somewhere sometime. Cause it's just, yeah, it's hilarious. And it's easily an hour and a half, two hour thing. If I go into detail to You're like a little really documentary. It. Yeah. It's, <laughs> and so I'm like, I don't know what that looks like, but it's funny yeah. and it would be worth talking about. And well, I think do I'm tell me when it comes to. out because you're dangling the worst carrot right now. I'm going to like know, call you offline and be like, tell me the story. I, <laughs> I need to know. Yeah, it's basically a lease option that the guy didn't uphold his end of the story, but then, uh, or end of the deal. But along the way, it was just, you know, misrepresentation and interfering with things and missing deadlines and just a whole slew of just things that kept going wrong, but then they were like intentionally going, you know, it'd be like, he did this thing and then was like, Oh, I didn't do that. And like, I have it on camera. Oh, I don't, I don't think that's wow. what happened. It's on video. <laughs> like, yeah. Mental yeah. illness is a thing. But okay. Here's my question for you, because I'm actually going to sell creatively on a house right now. I'm in the process of it. Would you do other creative deals or has a sour do for it? No. Most everything I've done is creative. What kind okay. of uh, way are you selling? Are you doing like a seller, uh, like seller a carry? subject to seller finance kind of wrap? Yeah, I'd, I would so. totally sell that way, uh, especially okay. especially because on the selling, like on the on the as the seller, uh, yeah, you know you're you're uh, you're doing you're you're in a good spot, right? Because if they default, you get the house back. So as long as you you just got to make sure you you know you you hedge your bet, but take enough of a down payment to give them skin in the game, and then. Yeah. If they default, you keep the down payment and you just sell it again. You win either way. Yeah. Well, just for any of your listeners that may not know what we're talking about, a subject to means that you take over the payments of someone's loan without technically assuming it. You're not fully taking that assumption, but you just take over the payments. And so it's great for right now because there's lots of people that locked in these really low rate mortgages. And now when interest rates are high, People are excited to get those deals and they'll often pay more for them. So that's what we're getting is we're getting like 50K more for our property, which is awesome just yep. because we are allowing them to have that lower mortgage and our spread, which we're seller financing, which is our equity. We're still doing 8% on that. So that's win, win, win. Absolutely. And if they yeah. default on the sub two, which, you know, there's the chance that that, I mean, that would hurt your credit, right? That's the one downside. 
But if they yeah. default on it, you get the property and keep their down payment and all the have, payments they've made. Yeah, and you still have the mortgage and I mean you're not it's not a it's not a you're you're not you're no worse off, right? You still have the house. Yeah. So it's whatever. All right. And they're not gonna default on that, I would imagine, if they have terms like that, because that's a win, right? So Yeah. Um let's hope not. Yeah. Here we go. I, I, th I think you will be all right. That's how the, I learn things. I just the, try them on. The <laughs> so lease option we'll see. Like mine wasn't a deal that went south because of the financing. Mine was a deal that went south because the guy like literally was making up leases and frauding and fudging P and L's. Uh, yeah. You got forging. like one crazy out of the bunch. It yeah. Just, like those happen. Um, and then, and then there were other things like, you know, uh, seller will replace roof within 90 days or a buyer hundred thousand dollars. And then, 90 days came and went, no roof, no $100,000. And there were like $120,000 worth of things like that that didn't happen. And then a whole bunch of other things where it was like, yes, I'm going to put the H crane, the HVACs onto the roof of the building. Yes, I'm going to do it next week. Yes, I'm going to do it. No, I never said I was going to do that. I'm like, here's three emails where you said you were going to do it and it's in the contract. I never said I was going to do that. Yes, you did mm. three times, as well as the contract you drafted and signed on this date, <laughs> like those kinds of things, you know. So it was just it was just a big case of yeah. fraud. Um, so it's not anything to do with the financing. The actual financing terms we got were great: one hundred and fifty thousand dollars down on a two point three seven five purchase at five percent interest with three years to execute, and it was interest only for the three years. So it was great. Dope. Yeah, yeah that's great. So, yeah. You but, say that stuff all too fast, but there's people in sorry. the background going like, what the actual fuck? But that's okay. <laughs> yeah. I try to yeah. break it down because on my podcast, everybody's a little newbie. Lots of babies I, on there. And I'm like, here's what this term means. I, this is what we're talking about. I guess I only that. say it that fast here's because it was babies. like four years ago. So if I was to try to explain what those numbers actually come out to, I can't remember. I remember yeah. the like percentage points, but I don't remember what the like I think it was like eight thousand dollars a month was still the payment on it. So it's you know yeah. still still a lot. But it was also bringing in like twenty three thousand dollars a month or something. It was a cool building too. It was sixty four thousand square feet, four stories. It had twenty residential units and like a murder mystery theater, a family Whoa. like orchestra. Um, Wait, do you a, still have kitchen. this building? I wish no. Okay. Crazy. Yeah. It's cool. Cool building, but Yeah. No. God, there's so many things I do not know about you. I'm actually realizing that it's probably more <laughs> things that I don't know about you than I do know about you. <laughs> I'm a I'm a Yeah. An interesting character. I don't know if that's a good thing, but it's uh it's interesting. Yeah. Well, I guess. Uh all right, what did we as we wrap up, what did we not cover? What what should we have touched on that we missed. Yeah. Well, I just want to tell people a little bit about the book. So oh, 30 yeah. Day I'm Stay, sorry. I wrote it with Sarah Weaver. Our intention for this book was to write something complete so that somebody even brand new could pick up the book, read it and go get um, a property right after. So we wanted to make it really action focused and really detailed so that everything was there as a good reference. And I think we did a good job with that. And then we tried to make it more interesting and less dry um, by putting in a lot of case studies and a lot of our personal stories. So I feel like people really get to know who we are through the book. And the last thing that I love is that we were able to highlight a lot of female investors. So the majority nice. of our case studies are women. Um, some of them are our friends. But yeah, I, I thought that that was really important because there are just so many men and this is like a male dominated space in real estate. And women, I just want to encourage them that there are certain places where we really shine and Furnish Rentals gives us a leg up. Um, yeah. So I think you, it's a good book. You, Go check you it out. Us, 30 Day Stay. Us ogres don't, don't do well at design? No. I mean, you can <laughs> do kidding. great too. But I think that women no, I have a natural I cannot, I cannot nurturing well <laughs> and, you know, presence and they want to yeah. be hospitable, all I, that kind of stuff. I yeah. have no business in design. Yeah, nope. that too. <laughs> <laughs> Not my space. Well, yeah. thank you for joining us. But where can people get a hold of you if they'd like to reach out to you directly? 
Yes. So Ziana McIntyre, if you look in the show notes for the spelling, I have a yes. website. So ZianaMcIntyre.com. But I'm very active on Instagram and then yeah, I'm in most of the social places. And if you want to get our book, it is at biggerpockets.com slash 30 day stay. And if you use my name, Ziana, you get 10% off. Ooh, fancy. Ooh, 10%. <laughs> yeah oh well, thanks for having me no I, thanks for loving joining this. and yeah. uh on your on your wedding day i'm thanks. feel special i'll tell alex he missed out yeah he's gonna be sad i know he's <laughs> but, i like to make alex sad yeah you know, who doesn't it's it's probably my favorite part of the show that's Making right. them miss things. No. <laughs> yeah. No. Thank you very much for joining us, and uh, I'm excited to let this one come out. And always a pleasure to hang out. Bye.